like yes. the middle Q4 for us, right? Yes. And this is, we are, we are going to take the next several um, minutes that we have together and just like put, put, leave that outside and we're gonna have just a great discussion. I read some things down that, that really speak to me. You say them like so much cooler sounding than I do, but I'm just gonna say a few of them, okay? And, and I want you to react to them. Okay. Gratitude and regret yep. drive you. Um, F your shortcomings, triple down on your strengths. Um, positivity and love always win the game. Uh, negativity and fear, not so much. Um, Let's stop right there for a second. Yeah. So even our political climate and definitely organizations, I, I think that negativity and fear are actually very good at winning the short game. I think you can see a lot of results through them. I see it all the time. I think a lot of things that happen at VaynerMedia at only 900 people and definitely at SAP at 95,000 people, you know, a lot of people are able to accomplish a lot of things by being in the no business by being in the, playing the politics to not allow the thing to happen business to being fearful because if you mitigate the risk, you aren't exposed. Um, you're not exposed to the upside, but you're definitely not exposed to the downside. So you, you said those in parallel. You know, for me, I have so many luxuries being an entrepreneur. Being an, you know, and I'm an entrepreneur that doesn't even have a board. So there's benefits and negativities, but no question the great benefit is that there's zero fear um, or one can think about it as it's the ultimate fear. You're the last line of defense. Everything is always anxious. There is no, you know, one of the great things about working in a company is getting to blame somebody else. You know, one of the things, no matter how senior an executive, one of the things that stinks about being the last line of defense is it is fundamentally your fault. Like literally, there are 947 things on the top of my head right now that are a disaster downstairs, right? And they're 100% my fault because I hired that person that is the last line of defense within that micro issue. So that being said though, I think it's super important. I think one of the things you feel for my team, one of the things, no question, the thing I'm most proud of is when I sit down with somebody who's worked very closely with them or after somebody's been in the org for a year, no question, one of the things that a lot of people talk about is the employees feel safe. And I think that um, that's super important in leadership and I definitely think that I think positivity, positivity always wins in the end because it's been proven. Like if you just look at the data of how humans have survived and how companies have thrived over a long periods of time, it's being on the offense versus the defense. And so I think about that a lot. Okay. So I, I want to go back for a second before we come back um, forward. So you, your story is pretty amazing. You have, um, you've done so many things, right? I can't even list them all. But I want to know, like, what was going through your head when you're like seven years old, when you're 14 years old? Was it a moment? Was it just like you just always remember feeling a certain way? Was it a person? Like, just tell us a little bit about your story and, and how it made you you. I was born in the former Soviet Union. Um, moved to Queens, studio apartment, eight family members. Like, in hindsight, only recently realized I my parents never spent money on anything, so I. Even when we got to middle class, it was in their spend. I mean, I went on one family vacation my whole life. I, my dad eventually owned a liquor store in Springfield, New Jersey, where you know I worked every single weekend and summer. And so I often tell a lot of my friends, I'm living your grandparents' life, not yours. We're not contemporaries. I'm a first generation immigrant in a merchant environment. And so, very different kid for a couple of other reasons. Being an 80s and 90s child and an immigrant, education was the only way out. We are now living in an era where entrepreneurship is a viable conversation. I'm 43 years old. When I was getting D's and F's in third and fifth and seventh and ninth grade, you know, the machine, and I, the machine was not only parents of my friends, but teachers, basically everybody outside of my mother was telling me that I was gonna lose. What, you know, so what's amazing about entrepreneurship, it's predicated on loving losing, loving fear, loving adversity. What has happened in modern day America is we've demonized losing. We give eighth place trophies. Parents are so in kids' shit that they are so scared to give them any adversity, which is why we're creating zoo animals and so many people can't succeed in real life. Mm -hmm. So what was happening at five, seven, 14? 
when, it, when I went outside to play, which is what you did in the 80s, kids, you know, uh, I thought it was more fun to ring people's doorbells and ask them if they would give me five bucks to wash their car than to do anything else. And so I was, I'm a born purebred entrepreneur. There's been nothing else that's ever been in my head, ever. Like I, com- I completely punted school by fourth grade and consciously, like literally with, like, and now, like, I spoke to some sixth graders the other day, and they're so little. I was like, Jesus, like, like at that age, I was so outrageously self-aware. In hindsight, I didn't call it that then. I didn't realize, but there was nothing going on in my operating system other than Saturn doesn't matter, algebra is not going to matter. It's just not going to matter. Like, I'm going to win. I'm gonna sell stuff, I'm gonna start a baseball card store, then it was later I'm gonna open up 500 liquor stores, then it was later I'm gonna build the biggest e-commerce wine business, which that one I did. And, you know, and so it was pot committed to what made me happy. And I just didn't hear anything else. Did you, did you always not care, not let what other people thought about you drive you, was there ever? Have it's, you just always not worried about that or did you get to a point where like, I'm desperately, I hate having a public life because I'm devastated when somebody leaves a comment, you know, that, that I'm a charlatan or, you know, or whatever they may say, snake oil salesman or, you know, growing up in the, it, it's crazy for me to be judged in the marketing Madison Avenue world as like full of shit watching these big companies sell garbage to clients, you know? so. I think a lot about this. I think that I had so much adversity as a child, right? Like when you're six and you're walking four miles to Kmart because you don't have a car and your mother grew up in Russia and everyone walked and that just seemed normal, like like it was just my normal, the answer is yes. I mean, if I could wish anything, I would wish the balance of self-awareness, self-esteem and empathy. A lot of what drives me is empathy. I'm. I'm not upset at people that judge me. I wasn't mad at the teachers. Their framework was, did I read Catcher in the Rye and know what to write in this test? I didn't read it, so I was in trouble, you know, but, and so it's it's really pulling from opposite directions. It's disproportionate confidence and being quiet within my head, yet being unbelievably empathetic to why the machine does what it does, and so, but yes, I mean, I have a disproportionately happy life because I don't like to be judged, I don't want to be razzed, but ultimately I don't give a shit. Yeah. No, I, so I, I love that. <laughs> and, and, and again, and I put myself in a position not to. It's not as easy when you work within a company when your boss's boss has an opinion of you, that matters. Exactly. I just decided school I, I don't know why I understood, you know, it's so funny, so much of what I talk about is the world came to me because I never went to the world, right? Like, entrepreneurship wasn't cool. Like, the world came to me. I stayed the course of being an entrepreneur. I was judged for working my dad's liquor store as a 26-year-old while my friends went to Wall Street and got a BMW. I just stayed the course and then all of a sudden you wake up and the world comes to you. Now everybody's, every, I mean, the, like, my Instagram DM is the most insane. Yeah, I, grew, I grew up a huge New York Rangers fan, like huge. One of the people I hate the most on earth is Yarmir Yager, right? <laughs> the other day my team sends me every week like which cool people follow me on Instagram this week, so Yager follows me. I click it, because I click, I always want to see, He's only following one person on earth. <laughs> if, if you guys right now go to Yarmir Yonder's Instagram, he follows one human, me. So I DM'd him and literally I just DM'd him, just me, question mark, and he replies, yeah, I think you're super funny and smart. I'm gonna keep it this way. <laughs> I wanted to say that I literally hate you with all my heart, but I held off and so. He invited me to dinner in Czechoslovakia, so I'm excited. (laughs) The point of that little humble brag is this. If you stay the course of what you are, a lot of good can happen. And when you're an entrepreneur and you put yourself in that position and you play outside the framework, you can do that. But you can't do that when you work somewhere. You have to play within a framework. And I have to play within frameworks. I have a client service business. I have to play within frameworks. I want to do a lot more business with your company. I text. 
you know, Bill, after every good jet situation, I'm like, eh, you know, like, I want to, but I have empathy of what a big company has to go through before they start working with a company like ours. So, empathy is, I, I've, I just started a direct-to-consumer wine brand. I went full circle. I grew up in a wine shop, and uh, on my birthday, seven weeks ago, I started a winery, direct-to-consumer only, and the wine is called empathy. It, like, for all my bravado, and confidence, and jerseyness, and alpha, no question, the disproportionate ingredient to my happiness and success is empathy. And, and it's what I'd like to see more in marketing. Mm-hmm. That's why I think we're doing great marketing. We make content and distribute it, being empathetic to the people that we're trying to reach, not being selfish to what we're trying to achieve, which is what I see from every single company. So I wanna, I wanna ask you about, you know, I feel, I'm 47 and I feel, you know, as I was getting ready for this conversation, I always remember growing up hearing people who are older than me say, you, you know, oh, when I hit my 30s or my 40s or my 50s, like, I just stopped caring so much about what everyone thought. And I always remember hearing that, but now I get it, because now I'm 47, I really don't care much to my children's chagrin what people think, <laughs> like what I'm wearing or whatever, right? And, but that took a lot of, that took years. Right, for, and you see the power, but when you really do let go, you see the power. So for people Best. who are sitting in this audience who aren't 47, yeah, um, how do you accelerate that, and how do you how do you get to that sooner than the years take you there? I don't know, and I'm trying. I mean, if you happen to follow me on Instagram, I am trying. I want people to have perspective. I feel like I'm an old. You know, I believe in certain things that are kind of weird, like. Like old soul is interesting to me. I was very intrigued. Maybe it's because I lost three of my four grandparents before I got to know them. But as a kid, when grandparents would visit the playground, I would always run and like sit with them for like an hour and be like, where were you when JFK got shot? I loved history. That was the one class I could get. You know, And a lot of my marketing is actually, I think a lot of what I'm doing now is predicated on what TV did in the 50s and 60s. Like when new mediums create, what do you do, right? Yeah. So history always kind of came to me and I, you know, I don't know how to help people disproport, like there's so much that DNA does. I don't care because for some reason I can feel things. I can feel being 90, laying there not being well, having only a little time left, and disproportionately not caring about what Tommy Johnson said about me in third grade or what article was, like, I don't know. My family, you know, maybe it's an Eastern European immigrant family, we were real, like, I was propaganda that like it was health, 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 you know, health was like, so like that's how I kind of live, like, for me it's like, as long as like nine people woke up this morning good, I'm just so grateful, you yeah. started, I'm, I'm so grateful that like everything else feels controllable. Yeah. You know, I don't know, I mean like, like it's like a logical conversation. It's like, like does it, re, like, you know, like why are you upset? This is why most people don't post on social media or they PR themselves on social. They're not capable of dealing with judgment and I'm like, are you really pissed that Ricky Pants 44 said you're ugly? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. and, then, and then it's empathy. I, I mean this one, and this is something I wish was more in the conversation in our society. If somebody has the time to watch your video or look at your picture and then take the time to leave a comment that you look fat or you're ugly or you're wrong or you're stupid or screw, like, I'm empathetic that their life is horrible. Like seriously, if you're a distributor of hate, you fucking lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, with a lot of people in the audience, you said it earlier, right? It's like when you're in a corporate context, um, you want to. You, you often don't say you're fucking lost. So, but when you're in a corporate context, right, you, you know intellectually, like, all right, I, I shouldn't care as much, I'm, I'm spending too much mental energy on this, um, I want to be free of that, but, like, you got to care what people think, you got to care what your boss think, you got to care about... Especially if you have variable bonuses, right. and, like, I mean, like, like, I mean, are you kidding me? Of so course you, you do. So how do you, so how do you balance that? Because I think you're right, like, I'm a big believer that when you start caring too much about something, and you give it that, you give it power and fuel. And it beca- it, it's like it's game over. It, it, it's you know. It's binary. Either you pander to the machine or you don't. There is no half pregnant. So, you know, this is Bill and the board's responsibility. This is what I think about at Vayner every day. Mm-hmm. Like it is my responsibility to create the framework for that. Yep. 
And so, I mean, here's the beauty. Like, you know, you could also leave. Like, I don't know. Like, my big thing to like, my big thing is like, you can sit and dwell about it that Karen's trying to ruin you, or <laughs> you can go work somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, you know, I, I, I do think we are not, I, I, there's a, you know, God, there's so many macro things going on in the world. I will say this, accountability is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And so like, like, I mean, like in this room, I, I think I'm gonna say like, if you live in America and you're complaining, yeah. your perspective's I broken. Totally agree with you. So you have options. Like, and you also know what you signed up for. I had a great meeting today with an incredible woman. She's just a beast and she's talking and like we may, I may hire her. Like I'm trying to make it up in my head. I like doing parallel things. Like I'm doing this interview and I'm super here with you but I'm secretly also in a different path. Like how do I hire this woman? She was so amazing. Amazing little, somebody introduced us and she was just talking about her now she's such a winner. And she was just talking and it was like, I backtracked to like the first part of the meeting. I was like, oh, you stayed at that company because you started a family at that point. She's like, yeah. Like something didn't make sense to me. And I was like, that's awesome. Like all of you know why you're still here. There's a million variables. College debt. You think you can be the CEO one day. Your mentor's teaching you something. You're continuously challenged. You like Hudson Yards. Like, like, <laughs> like it, you know, it could be a million things, but, um, but, the reality is, yes, like we're all like we're all playing life, and like if you're an employee in this company, yeah. um, it's very likely that you do have to worry about, you know, your boss's opinion, this, that, the other thing. And I, I think you have to reconcile what you've signed up for and try to navigate it. And when it becomes disproportionately not valuable, you have options, yeah. and the best organizations figure out ways to make it palpable. So you're a leader, you're an entrepreneur, you're a leader of people, you're a leader of businesses. I'm a big believer that leadership, there's certain things that never go out of style. Yes. Like hard work, preparation, having goals. Like right, there's certain things that will always be in style. Tried and true. But I'm a believer that a lot of the true, a lot of the profiles in leadership that existed when I started my career, right, there was like a small set and you would basically say, which one, you know, who who can I best relate to? All right, I'm gonna try to be like that, right? And today, that's no longer the case. And I think leaders today have to be, we talk about worrying about what people care about, but it's the people who work for you, whose opinion to me matters the most. Do you agree with that? I think leadership is, like true leadership is, in my mind, means you work for everybody else. Yeah. Like, I, like that is literally how I think about my life. I'm looking at several of them right now, and the, boy, when I, you know, looking at those five specifically, you're talking about three to, four to seven years you know, like that's hard to keep talent of that caliber in the same place. For, and it's and when I look at them, I've had some real fucking conversations with those five people, way more than you guys would ever imagine. For somebody who not only is a CEO of a very fast-growing business, but then if you know anything about me, I'm traveling around being Gary Vee. So like I'm busy. Mm-hmm. I think a leader needs to listen, and needs to be flexible at all times. Uh, when I look, you know. Lindsay didn't have a family when she first started working at Boehner. Like, you know, people fall in love, they get married, they are passionate about work, then they change the work. They're, you know, to me, basically, here's how I think about it. I work for 900 people in perpetuity and I'm prepared for something to change every second of every day. That's an anxious lifestyle. <laughs> It's an anxious, I'm telling you, it is. I mean, I'm worried that the leak might roof in our Chattanooga, Tennessee office. Like, it's all on you. Um, but it's my natural state. Okay, so you surround yourself, you're a big believer in surrounding yourself with kind of positivity and being around that and just cutting the negative stuff I do, out. I believe in so it. So who you surround yourself with? Who are the people? Tell us about who you choose to surround yourself with and why. It's a very small circle, like I have very few friends. I spend an outrageous amount of, amount of time with my mom and my wife, positive people. Brandon, my best friend who still runs the wine business, outrageously positive. Um, I have a team that works for me. It's impossible to be on that team for any more than a minute if you're not a positive person. So you know, whether it's an admin or a chief of staff or the people that help me build out my content, all the leaders that, my direct reports, the C-suite, you know, I definitely don't hold them to the same level of positivity because they have to reverse engineer certain things and have some empathy to what their day to day is. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I consume 
Like, I, I really, really, really think that positivity is a strategy and I think a lot of people think positivity is delusion. Mm. I think people think keeping it real is like important and I, every time I hear that I'm like keeping it real cynical and negative. You know, I think that, I think I'm the least delusional person of all time because I've had to run a business every day of my life. I've never raised capital and I've made payroll every week in, per, in my entire 22 years. So I've run actual businesses. All my startup friends who lose $2 million a month and think they're running a business, I laugh until the economy collapses and then you're out of business, right? So I keep it outrageously. How many people here are immigrants or children of immigrants? We keep it practical. So I'm very practical but I think you're able to look at a situation and decide if you're gonna fold like a cheap chair or start working on a solution. I keep things positive. Yeah, I love it. All right, last question though. I wanna make sure we leave a little bit of time for you guys to ask questions. So you talk about the internet as just been, having been an incredible opportunity. What's the next catalyst for the, for the next wave of opportunity you see? Voice. I think people are grossly, grossly underestimating what voice is about to do in our society. So Alexa, Google Home, I think a lot of you are gonna move to voice text messaging in the next decade, like voice. Voice to me is a humongous platform that a company of this size has to be disproportionately thinking about. Um, You know, it might take three to seven years. A lot of you have these devices in your home but it's mainly there for music or for funny jokes or for kids stuff but the iPhone's biggest app in year one was an app that made it look like you were drinking a beer. So when there's revolutionary platforms, a lot of times the software on top of it is not as revolutionary right away. I think you're gonna be, look, the only thing we actually care about besides health and money, religion, is speed. We hate, we we love lack of friction. We're New Yorkers and we take Ubers on the perception of speed watching other cabs drive by, right? (laughs) We, we, We hate friction, we will always choose speed. You don't care about privacy. We love talking about privacy in the mainstream media. You don't care about it. I watch you every day give up your privacy for any level of convenience. If I give you a hundredth of a second faster Wi-Fi to give up your privacy, you'd be in all day. <laughs> so, so I think voice lacks friction. You will be able, living in a voice activated environment at all times, in your home, in, your, in, your, in the offices in your office, uh, in your car, to do things faster than picking up the phone and texting. Voice is gonna be big, big. Okay, I know that there's a lot of people in the audience who would love to ask questions, so let's open it up. All right. First of all, amazing stuff. Oh, we have mics? Oh, let's, okay. Your voice is amazing, by the way, so. Loud voice. But we'll get, we'll get it to you anyway. I have a loud voice. We'll get it to you anyway. Okay, cool. yeah. Hey, pretty amazing stuff off the bat. Um, Thank you. So I just saw the company in the advertising space and I want to venture fund out the startup space here. And I wanted to ask about how you are able to create this very kind of tailored custom process at Rain Media, which doesn't exist in other agencies. And more specifically, like how that relates to the agency identity. We all know when someone uses that word, they're generally thinking of like a middle market broker who doesn't do anything. That's not what you guys do. You're very attentive to your clients. You retain clients because of that. How does identity play into some of the things that you talked about in the agency world? You know, I think when you have a, and listen, geez, this is gonna make a hell of a lot of sense for you guys. When you have a charismatic leader who is an over communicator and like willing to like be that person, she and he creates an identity every day of the week. Guys, every company stems from the top. It's just the way it is. And so it comes natural for Vayner because look, for example, I knew nothing about the agency world when I started my company. I started my company because I wanted to build a marketing machine for myself for when the economy collapses to buy businesses and run it through it because my biggest arbitrage is my ability to take businesses and hyper grow them on proper marketing of the moment. So I figured, you know, we just came out of like a dip in 2008 and 9. Um, Nobody knows what this social media thing is. I can learn a lot because I was a street kid so I'm like because I didn't have an MBA and that kind of life so I'm like, you know what? Let me go eat a little crow for a half decade learn a lot about big business, like build a little bit of business and then the economy will soften again and I'll buy something, I'll run it, boom, boom, boom. The economy's been good for like 10 years now. I've got golden handcuffs because our company exploded mainly because I'm building an agency to figure out how 
good what I do is at scale. Thus, when we're selling products to our clients, we're selling what we 100% believe, not where the margin is. The reason big companies are spending all their money on TVC and programmatic digital is because that's where all the margin is for media companies. It's garbage inventory, but it's highly profitable and they're all publicly traded companies. We backed into it. If I was just building an agency and I was trying to make my life and money on it, I would sell you programmatic banners and print and you know television too. Um, so our identity came from the merit of the intent. Other questions? Yeah, and, you, and by the way, real quick to just open that up and warm it up, like you can go very micro if you like, if there's a tactical question. I mean, yeah. if you sell peanut butter on the side on Shopify and Amazon, <laughs> I can tell you how to sell more peanut butter. <laughs> so I don't have a question about peanut butter. But as, but as, as parable, yes. the voice part that you yes. mentioned, um, I, I dictate all my texts. The problem with that is when I then leave a voicemail message, I leave the punctuation. Yes. So. I also think I also think what a lot of people are going to evolve into is just the voice in text form because I think what people are starting to learn is too much tone is lost. Like the company will tell you, my crew back there is when I send company wide emails, it's always a video because I'm petrified of somebody losing the tone mm-hmm. in the written word and through video there is just absolutely no vulnerability that somebody misses the context. So it's less about voice dictating to text, it's actually your voice in text, so it's like old voicemail, but going back and forth through text mm-hmm. form. So thank you. My question though, you talked about empathy. Yes. Which, um, I am a mom of two young kids and it's become a very, very strong word in our house mm. and it's taking on a lot of different meanings mm. um, in all of our lives. But you, you said something that I, I mean, Went elsewhere. It wasn't it? Seems that, common. So that's what I know. Story of my and life. I, and I, I, try, I try to ADD follow you. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Thank God they weren't classifying in the 80s. Yeah, so, <laughs> but you were talking about as marketers, we're, we, we're not empathetic. We're not. But you said we are, and that's where you kind of sway. Vayner? I was saying we are Vayner, mainly because one of the things my agency does extremely well is challenges how success is measured. We're not empathetic because your internal MMM is the lord of like brand and it's predicated on getting as many impressions as possible which justifies lowering CPM costs, which justifies lack of relevancy so you're in the vanilla business when we need to be in the Baskin Robbins business. So we are based on the fact that we make so much content and distribute micro distribution to get to insights to do the bigger work. We don't have the audacity that our strategists and creatives and your senior team is gonna sit in a room and come up with a slogan that's gonna change our lives. This company can run LinkedIn ads specific to the job titles of the decision makers in your company and you can speak to them. You can literally speak to them. And you could speak to them if they're an Asian American woman or an African American male working in a fast growth company or in a slow stodgy company. Like, it's your best salespeople are disproportionately empathetic and contextual. Mm-hmm. Disproportionately, promise you. And, uh, and our marketing is not. But the internet is here. Right? So. Like I sit in these meetings with a lot of leaders all the time and the first 30 minutes they'll scold me telling me that Facebook is tearing down our democracy and then they'll scoff at me when I want them to move budget to Facebook saying it doesn't work. And I go, so let me get this right. This product is so powerful that it is capable of tearing down one of the strongest institutions ever created in mankind, the American democracy but you don't think it can sell your SaaS product or some lipstick. (laughs) That's my life. (laughs) And it's because we accept things that aren't true. We're we're measuring based on things that are not true. All right, I see. Back, middle, you guys. Ladies. Hi. Hi. So you mentioned um, Instagram. Yes. You, you know, spend a lot of time on it. Yes. So a lot of millennials nowadays and everybody, right, around the 
around the world or from using Instagram. So what do you think are the best attributes of it and what are some of the worst? The best attributes are that it's where the attention is and the media product on it is disproportionately inexpensive. So that's, to me, I'm just very simple. It's, it's, is the, is the attention properly priced, overpriced, or underpriced? So for me, as a marketer and a businessman, the best part about it is it's disproportionately underpriced. Like, uncomfortably. Like, I'm looking at my taxes to figure out how I can spend more money on Instagram ads for anything I care about, whether that's selling sneakers or wine or getting my content seen. Um, what's worse about it is it's so popular it becomes the mirror of human shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Social media hasn't changed us, it's exposed us. So everybody wants to blame social media. Social media didn't make you the PR agent of yourself, you've always been. You just used to do that at work or at the coffee shop or at the PTA meeting. So I don't think there's a worse you know, other than what I know people think is the worst part about it, but it has nothing to do with Instagram. It has to do with 70 years of prosperity. That's what's happening in America. Like, we're able to worry about dumb shit. Tom, you got a question? I have a question. Top three ad campaigns that you've ever seen or taglines. Give us like the top three. Um, you know, my personal favorites are, where's the beef? <laughs> um, being a Jersey boy, I'm obsessed with PC Richards whistle. I actually, actually it's a good opportunity. One of the things I'm spending a ton of time right now is sonic branding. Like what does SAP sound like? In the same way as I can say Intel and Netflix and you've got a feel, I believe every brand on earth is gonna start moving into that direction. So we're building out those capabilities. Um, I, I have a real soft spot for priceless. Yeah, I thought that was really well done. Those three come first to mind. Hi, thank you. Hi. So this question is actually for both Jen and sure. Gary. Um, I strongly believe in the power of voice as well. And I know you both mentioned about the importance of leaders connecting with their teams and having empathy. Do you foresee anything as like podcasts being turned to use for internal communications? Mm-hmm. Like I could see some sort of thing. It's great to hear, you know, while everyone's traveling to hear directly from. You go first. Obsessed. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like could it, like in blown, like if any organization on earth has more than tw- 10 salespeople on the road, they should have an internal podcast. You can get across everything that you care about, communicating to your employees, because they will passively consume audio. Yeah, I'm, I think internal comms is a disaster in the world, right? Like nobody reads anything. Like you're not reading that email, right? So this is what lacks empathy. The organization wants to tell you about the new pro, you know, policy, but like they send it to you in like 16 paragraph email form and you're like, are you kidding me? You know, like, yeah. back to empathy. You know, it's funny, I'm looking at my team. I think I send, I'd love to see your heads on this. I think I send, Forget about the company-wide email where I actually do something in the body, which is rare too. I think 90% of my emails, 70% of my emails are only in the title. Mm. Right? Like 70% of my emails, the entire email is in the title. (laughs) That's empathy, right? That's why I love emojis. (laughs) I'm serious, I think emojis are disproportionately empathetic. Like I just wanna communicate something. I love when people are like, oh, you know what the nicest thing ever happened to me ever, Gary? I'm like, what? They're like, somebody sent me a letter. And then like, I'm like, okay. And then like four hours later, like texting so impersonal. I'm like, wow, you've literally put the medium on a pedestal, not what was in it. We live in a world right now where we're demonizing technology for no other reason than that you're getting old. Like, like watching it is fat, right? We, we demonize technology so much that we have to put old school shit on a pedestal. 
can somebody logically explain to me like why writing a letter is so this, because they took the extra time? Like I get it, but like what about the extra time they wrote in that massive email where they tried to articulate? Like it's just like, it's fascinating to watch people's ability to demonize the current and put the past on a pedestal. It is what people do. I will not do that. I will be 96 years old and I will be super fired up about the current and I'll be like, you're gonna do it, youngster, do it. Fuck, you know, like, I'm not gonna be like, back when we did fucking Instagram. You know, like, like I, that is not gonna happen. Cause it's already not happened, it's my DNA. I built Wine Library on the back of email and SEO and banner ads and direct mail. Anybody here live in Jersey for the last 10 years? 10 years? Great, some of you might even see billboards with me. Like, like, like it was, like, that's what the good deal was at the time. I can't wait, actually. Actually, the real exciting part of my career is upon me. I've exploded during the social media era. When I shit on social media in a decade, that's gonna be a very big kind of like decade for me because then I'll be able to put the flag in the ground because people didn't live, I wasn't public when I was obsessed with email or SEO or that stuff. So I'm really looking forward to that because then people realize my religion is the attention and the properly priced attention and then the message that's contextual to that platform. Like can we please stop putting television commercials on YouTube? We have to make content that's contextual to the medium. The fr- go watch, the, this is back to history, this is where this shows its face. Go watch the first 100 television commercials ever produced in America. They're radio ads. They're a picture and somebody's reading in radio voice. It took time for the Leo Burnett's of the world to invent the Keebler Elves and the Jolly Green Giant. That is my ambition for Vayner. That one day it will be on a pedestal as the organization that understood how to create the contextual creative of that generation. So I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here. This has been, like, I could just spend the whole day. Um, I, Let's I, do it. I'm ready to do it. I mean, this, I'm just getting started here. We can, can we sneak one more question? Anybody really got one? Yes. All right, is there anybody who has an asked question? Be- no? Behind. Right. Yep. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good, how are you? Awesome. You see tons of startups all the time. Yes. I would love to know your, the ones that are really exciting for you that you've seen in the last This is a funny way to end this talk. Um, this is where lack of delusion will share its head. Um, this is actually a fun way to end. I have basically not invest, as somebody who invested in Facebook and Twitter, and like, I have a very lucrative investing career and was super right, I'm investing in nothing. This is the greatest era of fake entrepreneurship ever. Uh, I'm just not investing, everything's overvalued. 99 out of 100 people are great number threes and sevens but wanna be ones because it's cool and I'm just not capable of guessing. And so, you know, what excites me, voice, boy, I'm really like, I brought it up and I'll bring it up again, I can't wait to start investing in the apps built on top of the voice device, right? Like, when you think about it, he's holding up an iPhone, like I, what I understood about the iPhone when it came out because it had an operating system with apps on top of it, was that the apps on top of it were gonna be a big, big, big deal because now we had a phone that had the internet on it and I knew that would be good. As cool as, you know, like, the Blackberry was great but like a smartphone of that level, like, you know, it's like, it was gonna work. Now think about it, Facebook, I don't, you know, I know the stock market's up, but like, whatever, probably eventually becomes a trillion dollar company, but let's say a $500 billion company, $300 billion company, is literally just a company of five apps. Right, Spotify, Waze, like, like Instagram, like, like, our culture has now been pretty much living through apps on a phone. And so, but for a lot of you, remember this, 10, 11 years ago, it was just like apps on a phone, like it felt lightweight. I think the apps on top of voice devices are gonna be a big deal, so I will jump into that. I'm very, pa- I am excited about direct-to-consumer CPG brands, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I brought up the, I didn't bring up the, you know, uh, uh, peanut butter by accident. Like, I do think it's remarkable that if you love raspberry jam or maple syrup or ties or glasses, like, the lack of friction to go from zero to three million dollars in sales on the back of Shopify, Instagram, and Amazon right now is like really uncomfortably amazing. So, I've 
been flirting with some of that stuff, but right now this is like, I'm super on the sidelines. I'm head down to build the best marketing machine in the world, wait for the world to collapse, um, hire a bunch of those people that will realize they were number threes and sevens and nines, which is why I'm taking a lot of the meetings. It's super cool. Like I love playing life where nobody realizes what I'm actually doing. <laughs> and that's been the story. Like a lot of times I almost wonder if I almost sandbag myself and my persona to give me air cover to navigate. I've loved that corporate America and Madison Avenue have put me on the side of like, that's that Twitter kid, like he's just a loud, ma- like that's given me the air cover to become dangerous. Mm-hmm. So I'm willing, you know, this is betting on your strengths. Mm-hmm. Because I'm willing to take criticism and I don't need, you know, the, the chief creative officer of Ogilvy to think I'm cool. Like I'm able to navigate through, through the short term. My whole life has been, you're an idiot, you, you know, you're wrong, you're ridiculous, you're a genius. Like, it, you know, that's what's so great about business. You're either right or wrong. I'm not worried about getting booed in the second quarter. So, I'm meeting a lot of people right now not to invest, I'm meeting because I'm like, oh, you're a number six. <laughs> Can't wait till your company goes out of business. <laughs> and I will send you such a sweet note and be like, come work for me. And what's cool about six, you know, one thing I don't know yet, because we're gonna have to go through this cycle, but a thesis, a hypothesis I have, is a lot of these number sixes are gonna be unbelievably empathetic to their CEOs and number ones because they just went through the carnage of getting blown out, Mm -hmm. which a lot of you didn't have the benefit of because that's not what business school or your MBA or you know college Mm -hmm. teaches. So I'm curious, that's gonna be really interesting to watch what the cliche 31 year old, Mm -hmm. she ran her business for six years, she got blown out because everything was overvalued, but she learned a ton of skills, Mm -hmm. right? She truly, if she was, 20 years older would have been a Goldman Sachs dynamo and now she's coming in but she has a lot of experience, different experience, but she has empathy. Because that's what leaders struggle with, the loneliness. Like it seems super cool. If you wanna know why I'm putting out so much entrepreneurship content around fake entrepreneurship, it's to limit the suicides that happen in the inevitable outcome of what's about to happen. I really believe that. I'm very worried about that. There's so, do you know what a public scarlet letter is for a kid that was always successful in school mm-hmm. and always lived in fake environments and now they jump out of Wharton, publicly fail in front of everybody's face? I'm telling you, it is the, I, I make that statement and it's because I already know of the suicides that are happening in startup and entrepreneur land and it's not, when I say it's not being talked about, it's not being talked about. And it's happening because people are not deploying self-awareness. I wish I was a quarterback of the New York Jets. It just wasn't gonna happen. Entrepreneurship's tricky. If you say you're gonna be a rapper or a professional athlete or a supermodel, it kind of is very easy to tell if that's happening. (laughs) (laughs) Putting entrepreneur in your Instagram bio because your mom on the back end is subsidizing it. So I'm I'm quite worried about it because I love this. It's, It's the, as you can imagine, I'm emotional about it. It's the thing that put me on. It's going to be massively demonized in America on the back end of this. Because we don't blame ourselves, we blame the banks. The banks ruined our economy in 2007, right? Or was it people that were buying $400,000 homes that were $80,000 in debt making $72,000 a year? We're not gonna blame ourselves because the Uber of dry cleanings didn't work. It wasn't me, it was, I was sold that entrepreneurship was cool. We don't have accountability. And that leads to remarkable unhappiness. So that's an outrageous soapbox answer (laughs) to not much. I'm gonna ask the final question. Please. Okay. Um, So you've been around for a long time. Leave us with a piece of advice. You know, I'm a big believer in just the power of optimism and, and what that can do in, you know, simple situations and just, you know, long term. Give us practical advice. How do you how do you actually put that to work every day? 
So, a couple things, I apologize, I'm gonna bounce off and I'll come back. As you were setting up, like, ooh, this is a really good thing to say. There's a very important thing that I could pass on to this room. Start becoming a practitioner. So many of you have opinions about marketing behaviors, yet you've never run a single ad or a piece of creative on that platform. You're headline reading. So start a side hustle where you sell a scarf and then see what these platforms do. And sell them to 59 year old white tech dudes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Comp it to your business. Cause you may say, well that's fine Gary, but we're selling to you know, you know, heads of ITs or ISOs or what, you know, whatever it may be. So um, I think that, I, just, just to like tell like how excited I am, the, one of the most fun things for me is being involved with major SaaS exits out of startup land over the last decade by running ads on LinkedIn to CIOs and making creative. Like how this company's not doing that at scale is just like, you know? So become a practitioner. Mm-hmm. Everybody here should take a thousand bucks and run LinkedIn ads. Just do it. So as far as practical, practical optimism, mm-hmm. it's really interesting. My, my sister who's three and a half years younger than me is super not optimistic. And we took this trip to Asia and I don't know what the hell happened, maybe being on the other side of the world, but she's literally come back a different human being. It's probably because I suffocated her for 115 hours <laughs> straight. I don't know what happened, but here's one thing I do know that happened on a trip. In a group setting with a bunch of people that came to like meet me in a VIP thing, she finally said out loud uh, a huge vulnerability of hers around how she was subsidized by our parents. So she lived in a fake environment. And by putting out that poison, mm-hmm. it like completely transformed her life. Like, I'm not kidding, it's super spooky for me because I love her with all my soul. She's 39 years old. She's a fundamental different human being in the last nine months of her life than she's been every minute prior to that. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's predicated on that she said out loud something that was harvested inside of her and she, it changed the outcome. I think optimism is predicated on transparency. You want to have a better relationship with your boss? Tell her your vulnerabilities and insecurities. I think think going naked, I think about Eight Mile a lot. Eight Mile the movie (laughs) of Eminem (laughs) ends with a battle rap. Eminem goes first, which is a vulnerable spot in battle rap if you know that culture. (laughs) But he does something super unique. His entire rap isn't about the other guy, it's about himself. Mm -hmm. And he shits on himself for three minutes straight and he goes, now what are you gonna say? And it's super duper important. One of the reasons I think I've been able to do what I do is I play Eminem, I talk about my shortcomings, I I own them, I love them. I love that I, if you go pick up my first book that I ever wrote, Crush It, I acknowledge my family and one random person. Not that one, the first one. Travis, Travis Kalkin, the founder of Uber. The only human that I felt compelled enough in my small circle to thank besides my parents. During that writing of that book, he started, he, it's a really interesting story, the story of Uber. It was an idea and they hired an outside team. But nonetheless, Travis asked me to invest in Uber twice. Not once, he came back a second time. Every time I pass that grassy knoll in San Francisco, like I wanna vomit on myself. But I love that feeling, I love losing on merit. I passed on Uber twice in a world when I was investing on everything. And for who knows why, I decided not to invest in somebody I believed in and this idea. I, I, I still like would want to know. Really it's interesting, I, the only thing I've been able to figure out is I just bought a new apartment and I wasn't as liquid as I wanted to be. I was on defense. Right? Nonetheless, if I wrote my normal $50,000 check, $25,000 check, I would have made $400 million. (laughs) You know? (laughs) I talk about that stuff all the time while I'm a fancy CEO and genius investor. Right. Because it's the truth. I like it. And most importantly, it's, it's, I want to teach by actions. If you actually talk about your shortcoming, fear, or vulnerability to the people above you, you will turn the leverage back in your favor, then you can start deploying optimism because deploying optimism, you can only do that after you felt you've done everything you can to set it up. 
And so I think a lot about that. I love it. I think the truth is the best gift you can give to somebody. And let me say one thing about the truth. It's on the rise. All this pain that we're going through right now in society, this is predicated on the truth. You can't hide Matt Lauer. <laughs> no, but I mean it. I mean it. I'm not, I don't want to pick on Matt. There's a billion Matts and they're all going to get smoked the fuck out. And I think that is phenomenal because it's predicated on the truth. And then there'll be pendulum swings and guess what? There's some macro, I know a story being written right now on a macro female executive and then we're going to be like, oh, there's that version too. And there's going to be all sorts of stuff because you can't hide because the internet won't let you. <laughs> and so that to me is actually a very interesting 50, 60 years for humans to reconcile because we were taught to navigate through the shadows. Mm-hmm. I'm unbelievably optimistic and super sad. I'm so sad that I don't get to live 100 years from now because that's gonna be an awesome human existence where we're not gonna demonize all our shortcomings because we're gonna be through a whole century of exposing everyone's shortcomings and then we're gonna realize something I intuitively understood. We all suck. (laughs) We all have shortcomings. And to me, that lack of judgment creates a very happy place. So I'm, I'm very excited about what's happening. It's just gonna take a long time for us to reconcile it.